this profound understanding of the necessity of these things in order for humans to truly come to terms, so to speak, with God. We might also add, uh, this is kind of an aside, a historical aside, but it is in effect a kind of repudiation of the theology of afterlife that we see elsewhere in the ancient Near East, especially from Egypt. Because in Egypt, you do have a theology of an afterlife, uh, what they spoke of as entering the Western lands or the blessed realm or the land of Osiris, of uh, you know dying and living forever in bliss with the God. But in Egypt, it was always dependent upon having uh, the body preserved and a fixed funerary cult. Why did the Egyptians have such elaborate tombs? And why did they mummify? Well, if you know anything about Egyptian mummification, they would preserve several things. Before they would mummify the body, they would take out what they considered to be the vital, essential organs of the body. And they would put them in these jars called canopic jars. And they would be preserved inside these jars. The body would then be mummified. And in the mummification process, the skin especially was preserved. The rest of the body just kind of desiccated away. And in fact, all the dried away, dried up. But then, the, as I say, the vital internal organs had been preserved in these canopic jars. And the idea was, if you preserve your skin, your body, and your vital organs, and you put them in a proper tomb, and you have a, a proper funerary cult set up, where people will come to your tomb, and they will make offerings, and they will give the appropriate prayers, then you can live on in the realms of Osiris. What Job is saying is, after his skin has completely turned to dust, has been utterly destroyed, and after his internal organs have completely disappeared, utterly withered away and dried up and turned to nothing, Still, he will have a vision of God. So it is a resurrection theology that is quite different from, from notions of the afterlife such as existed in ancient Egypt. Why might that be important? It might be important because he's saying, he's not saying, well, I'm here subscribing to just one standard view of afterlife such as we see in Egypt. He's saying, no, this is something completely different. This is a redeemer figure who triumphs over the dust and who raises me up even though my whole body has turned to dust. Okay? Yes? What is the identity of Job's redeemer? What do you think? Who do you think? Uh, is it uh, is this is it God the one who is his opponent? Will God also be his redeemer? Well, that's a very good uh, notion. It's in fact, it's a very common opinion. You a number of people will defend the view that the redeemer that Job is looking for is God Himself. I don't think that's possible because Job clearly speaks of the redeemer standing between him and God, and he also speaks of the redeemer. As, as being human, you know, as having as much in common with him as he has with God, as much in common with Job as he has with God. And so I think he is thinking of some other figure. And again, I, my translation of Achron as future, someone who has not yet appeared on the scene, at least in historical circumstances. And so um, I think he is thinking of if you will, an eschatological figure, a, a future figure who will come, who will stand between God and man as equals, and who will bring about resurrection. Isn't so, there a, a wicked interpretation, though, that go ahead. Uh, a redeemer is also an avenger of blood, and that mm -hmm. if Job feels that he is an innocent victim, that he will have an avenger of blood to 
to uh, uh, take vengeance on his behalf against his enemy? The Redeemer is basically one who's, in my, it's not necessarily vengeance. It can be. But a Goel, a Redeemer, is someone who sets things right after death, after a death has occurred. Um, in the book of Ruth, the Redeemer doesn't kill anybody. There's no blood vengeance there. But you do have a situation whereby, um, you know, Naomi's husband has died, Elimelech. No, not Elimelech. What's his name? Can't remember. Well, I'm sorry? No, I don't know. No, I, look, in, look in Ruth chapter 1. Is it Elimelech? Okay, that didn't sound right. Yes, it is Elimelech. That's right. Elimelech is uh, her husband. He's died. And she has no sons to take care of her because her sons have died. And the property is at risk. And she has, again, no one to care for her. So a situation has been made bad by death. And the Redeemer is a figure who will come in and make it right. Uh, you can have a Redeemer who does vengeance if there is a murder. And then the Redeemer goes and he pursues the murderer. But that's not intrinsic to the definition. And so speaking of this mediator as a Redeemer doesn't imply he's going to engage in violence. But it does, I think, imply, you know, what, did you, what does Job speak of? He speaks of his impending death. And he speaks of his body turning to dust. And somehow the Redeemer will make that right. So that's how I interpret that. Go ahead passage so I'm just curious um, could it be both a third party and could the Redeemer be both a third party and God himself or would that be anachronistic I mean it's conceivable I for my as I understand it within the dialogues themselves within the speeches of Job Job is really looking for someone to stand between himself and God and so then to say, well, the Redeemer is God, does, uh, doesn't seem to fit. Now, having said that, obviously, you know, we as Christians, and we obviously see here the Redeemer is Christ, and we want to see Christ's divinity upheld as well. Well, I think it is, but, but not by simply saying the Redeemer is God, but, but something that Job does say in his speech is that he wants the, the, the Redeemer would have to be able to speak to both God and men as equal. And so in the final analysis, who can speak to God as an equal but God? And if you even wanted to push it further, if you simply say, as a number of interpreters do, the Redeemer is God, then you simply have, I don't know how else to put it, a, a Unitarian view of God. I mean, here's God, God is God, God does what God does. But if you have a Redeemer figure who is, in, in a sense, a different person, but also speaks to God as equal, then you're much closer to a Trinitarian theology, where, you know, God is one God, but he's more than one person. And so I think you actually can, in that fashion, move towards a Trinitarian, if you will, theology within the book of Job. But not simply by saying the Redeemer is God, but the Redeemer's function is to speak equally to Job as a human and to God as God. But if he's a different person, you know, you get to this, finally arrive at a situation of God in more than one person. at the same time um, or is that reading too much into Job's theology to see that he's Trinitarian well you know I, I would not call Job Trinitarian in the fully developed sense because I mean that a lot of that is you know from the standpoint of Christian theology and the New Testament and so forth so I would not say Job is Trinitarian in the developed sense I would say there are implicit kind of hints at a Trinitarian theology. Um, the rest is just kind of 
sort of hidden and veiled. I mean, you've got the fact that you've got a redeemer. You've got Job looking at God as his enemy, but a redeemer who can be both God and man. And so um, that's where I think I would leave it. All right. Goodness sakes. Let's look then at chapter 21, Job's next speech. What we have here is Job attempting or, or rather forcefully rejecting traditional arguments regarding theodicy. And um, I'm just hesitating how much to give you. It's another chiastic text. I don't think you need another chiasm. But let me, uh, let me quickly look at what Job says here at certain points and, and bring out what I want you to see. Keep listening to my, the verse two. Keep listening to my words. Let this be your comfort. Bear with me. I will speak after I have spoken. Mock me. So again, he opens his speech by talking to the friends and saying, OK, I'm going to say something important when I'm done. You'll just attack me. But here it is. Jump down to verse seven. Why did the wicked live, reach old age, grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence, their descendants before their eyes. Their house is safe from fear. No rod of God is upon them. Their bull breeds without fail. Their cows calve uh, and do not their cow calves and does not miscarry. They send out their little boys like flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre rejoice to the sound of the pipe. Well, what do we have here? This is the wicked prospering. He says, look around, be honest. You can find lots of bad people who are rich and healthy and they have lots of kids and they enjoy life. So where's all this about the wicked constantly getting punished? Um, verse 13, they spend their days in prosperity and peace. They go down to shell. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. What is the almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Behold, is not their prosperity in their hand? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. So, you know, um, you have lots of people who just have no use for God, who have no intention of praying, and yet who do extremely well in life. And you can speak of, well, of course, there are those, you know, and their marriages break up or their children rebel. And you can find a lot of examples like that, but you can even find examples of people who have good marriages, good families, and they are atheists. You know, they have no knowledge of God. They don't care about God. And so Job is saying, look, it's just not true that the wicked are always hammered by God. They seem to do quite well. Um, verse 17, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? Their calamity comes upon them. God distributes pains at his anger that they are like straw before the wind, like chaff that the storm carries away. Well, isn't this right out of like Psalm 1? The wicked are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Job says, well, sometimes they don't seem to get driven away. Verse 19, you say God stores up their iniquity for their children. So here he cites kind of a traditional response. Well, if people aren't suffering for their sins, God will bring their sins down upon their children. What does Job say about that? He says, verse 19b, let him pay it out to them. In other words, not their children, so that they may know it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what do they care for their houses after them when the number of their months is cut off? You know, when they're dead, do they really feel any pain because something happens to their children? So he says God should punish them while they're alive. Uh, let's skip down to verse 23. One dies in his full vigor, being wholly at ease and secure, his pails full of milk, the marrow of his bones moist. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having tasted prosperity. 
They lie down alike in the dust, and the worms cover them. What is he saying there? He's saying, you know, you think death is kind of the solution that God, uh, you, you can kind of justify the ways of God by saying, look, they'll ultimately be punished with death. But he says, well, look, the wicked die, the righteous die, the rich die, the poor die, they all go down to the grave. So is that really any kind of a solution? No, it's not. Now, again, remember this is in the Old Testament, which has a very limited developed doc development of a doctrine of an afterlife and no very little in the way of a clear doctrine of hell. Verse 27, Behold, I know your thoughts, your schemes to wrong me, for you say, Where is the house of the prince? Where is the tent the wicked have lived in? Have you not asked those who travel the roads, and do you not accept the testimony of the evil man, that the evil man is spared from the day of calamity? So basically what he's saying is, you know, you can look around at the world and you can find all kind of counter examples to your wisdom. Yeah, you can find examples of wicked people who died, but you can find examples of good people who've died. And you can find examples of wicked people who've lived long and have done well. Verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 21. Chapter 21 is the place where Job really, in the most blunt possible way, confronts the doctrine of retribution. Now, again, I would say to you, he doesn't really reject it altogether, or at least in terms of the whole book. He, the book doesn't reject it altogether. But it is pointing out that the doctrine as it is conceived is inadequate. On the one hand, as we've just been looking at in chapter 19, there has to be an eschatological solution. If God is going to sort all this out, to some extent, it has to be sorted out after death. On the other hand, there has to be God has to be something, doing something beyond the doctrine of retribution. The way God is managing the world, the way God is controlling everything and setting everything in its proper place, moving history forward, there has to be more to it than just that God is punishing the wicked and rewarding the righteous. So again, it's not that this notion of retribution is wrong. It is correct following the book of Proverbs, that as a general rule, if you live a bad life, you'll come to a bad end. If you live a good life, you will thrive. That's all basically generally correct. On the other hand, there are counterexamples, and the doctrine of retribution is not the answer to everything. So that's what I think is going on here. Job, for his sake, now they're talking about the man Job. The man Job at this point still to a great degree is totally committed to the doctrine of retribution or wants to see it justified and he himself is shaken to the core. He is honestly describing what he sees in the world, but it is not a pleasant thought for him. So he says in verse 6, 21 6 when I remember I am dismayed and shuddering seizes my flesh so again it's the idea that he looks at the prosperity of the wicked and it it's it scares him it frightens him because it makes him wonder if his whole theology has been wrong now we're coming to near to the end. Chapter 22, of course, is where Eliphaz makes his harsh accusation of Job, really tears into him and accuses him of everything under the sun. Then we get to Job's speeches in chapters 23 and 24. And he basically, in these chapters, repeats a great deal of what he said already. So we're going to summarize this very quickly. 23, 1 to 7, he wishes again he could stand before God and make his case. 23, 2, today also my complaint is bitter, my hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him 
and fill my mouth with arguments. So again, still functioning from the framework of the doctrine of retribution, he wants to enter into a case with God because he thinks the real issue is, is it just for God to punish him when he's been righteous and he thinks he can prove he's been righteous? Uh, and so once again, he wants to do that. <clears throat> he says, however, that his innocence does him no good because God is hidden and God does whatever he chooses. And this is 23, 8 to 17, beginning in verse 8. Behold, I go forward. He's not there. Backward, I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right. I do not see him. He knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall, become out as, I shall come out as gold. So what is he saying here? He's saying, I can't find God. I can't come to trial with God. I can't stand before him and make my case. If we would have a trial, I would come out as gold. That is to say, I would be acquitted and shown, right, shown that I am righteous. So it's the same basic stance. Third, he makes the charge that God doesn't seem to judge the guilty or to help the righteous. And this is in chapter 24, verses uh, 1 to 25, pretty much the whole chapter. Why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? This is verse 1. Why do those who uh, know him never see his days? And then he gives this big description of the wicked. Some move landmarks, they seize flocks and pasture them, they drive away donkeys of the fatherless, they take the widow's ox for a pledge, they thrust the poor off the road, the poor of the earth hide themselves. Behold, like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go out uh, to their toil seeking game. The wasteland yields food for their children, they gather their fodder in the field, they glean for the vineyard of the wicked man. All, they lie all night naked without clothing. They have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the rain of the mountains and cling to the rock for lack of shelter. Now, I want you to see here, I'm going to pause, but let's... He begins by talking about the wicked. They move landmarks. In other words, they steal property. They seize flocks. They push poor people out of the road. So they're wicked. But he moves from that to talking about the suffering of the poor. They're like wild donkeys. They labor all day and see none of the fruit. They sleep in the rain. They have no shelter. They go about naked, verse 10 says. Verse 10 says. Uh, in verse 11, they work in the olive groves of the wicked, but they don't share in the wealth. So these are people who are suffering terribly. And what do we have in this passage? Well, it is yet a further development in our little progression of Job. We've been talking especially lately about afterlife and the intermediary. <coughs> but we also have the idea of redemptive suffering. Job speaks with great eloquence about the suffering of people and about those who are afflicted and those who work themselves to death, and those who starve, who are exposed to the elements. And again, what we have here is something Job doing that the friends never do. In his suffering, he is identifying very profoundly with the suffering of other human beings. And so he is kind of developing in his... Um, his role as a sufferer. But then he goes back and he talks about the wicked again. Look at verse 13. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with his ways and do not stay in its path. The murderer rises before it is light, that he may kill the poor and the needy. In the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for twilight, saying, No eye will see me. He veils his face. In the dark they dig through houses, by day they shut themselves up. They do not know the light, for deep darkness uh, is morning to all of them. They are friends with the terrors of deep darkness. So he's saying there's just wickedness everywhere. You know, again, where is God? Where is this retribution that we're supposed to be seeing all over the place? 
Verse 18, you say, swift are they on the face of the waters. Their portion is cursed in the land. No treader turns toward their vineyards. Drought and heat snatch away the snow waters. So does Sheol take those who have sinned. So Job's saying, well, now you're going to say that they all die. They all suffer. God punishes them. They, um, they lose their prosperity. You know, drought and heat snatch away the snow waters. So it snatches away these people. Job basically says, that's not true. Take another look. Verse 22. Yet God prolongs the life of the mighty by his power. And they rise up when they despair of life. He gives them security. They are supported. And his eyes are upon their ways. They're exalted. And then they're gone. They're brought low and gathered up like all others. They're cut off like the, like the, ugh, like the heads of grain. If it is not so, who will prove me a liar, show that I'm wrong? So basically, Job is saying the, the, the wicked do often prosper. They do well. Yeah, they eventually die, but so does everyone else. So how does that really solve anything? Okay, coming finally to the end of Job's speeches and this first part. And we come... Uh, Are we doing? Yeah, well, I guess we can. I can just summarize this very quickly and we'll be done with it. 25 is Bildad's final speech, this very short speech that we talked about, and we will say more about this later. But in 25, Bildad gives the very last word from the three. And then Job gives his answer. And it is here in his answer that Job starts to sound so much like the three. Look at 2713. This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of the oppressor receives from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword. So if a wicked man has a lot of kids, they'll all be died. They'll, they'll all be killed. And his descendants have not enough bread. Those who survive him, the pestilence buries, the widows do not weep. Though he heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the righteous will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. He builds a man's house like a moth, like a booth that a watchman makes. He goes to bed rich, but will do so no more. He opens his eyes and his wealth is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. In the night, a whirlwind carries him off. The east wind lifts him up and he's gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls him at him without pity. He flees from its power into headlong flight. It clasps its hand at him and hisses at him from his place. So that's where Job ends his speech in 27. And he sounds so much like the three at that point. He says the wicked may prosper, but it's only for a little while. They'll have a lot of wealth. Suddenly it'll be gone. They may have children, but their children will die or they'll they'll fall into poverty. So he he seems to wind up saying, yeah, God punishes the wicked. And it seems to contradict mightily everything he's just said. So, as you know, many commentators, uh, critical commentators, especially will look at this and say, well, the text has obviously suffered in transmission. Something is wrong here. Because this clearly is a speech of the three, and it is put into the mouth of Job. Furthermore, the speech of Zophar is missing. So probably this is the missing speech of Zophar. Or, you know, they might modify it in some way, but basically that's it. I have already mentioned to you that a standard kind of apologetic is to say, well, actually, Job is just kind of uh, giving a, a mimicry of their speeches. He's parroting their speeches. He's showing that he knows this stuff as well as they do. And I suggested to you the other day that I don't think that's quite adequate. So what do we do with this material if, it's, if the text is not to be just rearranged? I would say to you, my opinion is, my interpretation, 
is that Job is saying this because he believes it. Job is committed to the doctrine of retribution. This is something that he himself through the whole debate is holding to because his whole point is, God, I want to enter into judgment with you to prove I am innocent and that I don't deserve what has happened to me. If Job didn't hold to the doctrine of retribution, there's no reason he would make such a, he, he, he would demand a hearing with God. So I don't think that uh, the text should be rearranged. It should be considered to be corrupted. The question is, though, why does Job at this point make this statement? Well, in my view, it's probably a way of saying, well, it's kind of like the I know that my Redeemer lives. For all of his suffering and for all of his pain, he is orthodox. He's not become some kind of a radical or liberal or something like that. He believes in a God who punishes sin. And he wants to see it all worked out. And his whole world is coming apart because he doesn't understand why all this has happened to him. The last thing I would want to mention is this is, of course, where these three cycles end. And as I said, we'll talk more about Bildad's conclusion uh, tomorrow, actually. But the conclusion of the matter, as far as Job is concerned, I mean, how could we summarize it? We could summarize it by saying, Job, from beginning to end, the last word that he gives to the three before the wisdom poem of chapter 28 is a confession of faith in the doctrine of retribution. For all of that, Job's great desire is to be able to stand before God and prove that he, Job, is innocent and that God should not have punished him in this way. Along the way, when he's not just lamenting his pain and, and chastising the three and not saying he wishes he could stand before God, he is undergoing a transformation that he himself maybe is not fully aware of. He is far more aware of the suffering of people. He is aware of the need for an intercessor between himself and God. And he's aware that ultimately the human situation has to be resolved eschatologically. There must be a resurrection. There must be an ultimate final place where God sets everything right. And then the last thing I would say with regard to the three cycles is for you to be aware of you know, what I've been pointing out. How divergent the path of Job is from the path of the three. The path of Job has taken him to these, you know, for all his his rash statements. Has brought him to these incredible insights the path of the three has just taken them to hostility and meanness and finally telling lies. You know, claiming Job committed all these sins that he in fact never committed. And so I think that's what the text wants us to see as it suddenly interrupts everything with this big poem of wisdom.